I've welcomed you all here tonight already, and I'll just quickly go through what the night is going to entail. So first thing we will have are some rapid fire talks by some UNE um, PhD students. And the idea behind these talks is that it's, it really comes down to science communication. There's no point in having good science if we can't communicate it to people who aren't as scientifically literate as a scientist is. So a lot of this is about developing science, the future scientists and their communication skills. Then we're going to have some fun with trivia. <laughs> little break and then uh, Dr Liz New from Sydney Uni will be giving us her special guest talk, which is fantastic. I've seen it before. Q&A panel and then we'll, we'll close the evening. So... Leah McDonald, come on down. So we have it's three minutes. So she has three minutes to convince you that what the research she's doing is absolutely fantastic and important. And I'll hand over to Leah. When my slide comes up, I'll start. <laughs> Being pint of science, I know it would have been awesome if my research was in beer, but I think wine's the second best thing. We, most of us will enjoy a glass of wine, and most of us are somewhat aware that wine is majority water with around 12% ethanol, give or take, depending on what sort of wine you're drinking. What might be less commonly known is that although around 98% of wine is just water and ethanol, there's actually thousands of compounds that go into a wine. And many of these contri contribute to a wine's flavour and aroma. Unfortunately, the complexity of wine is somewhat lost on myself, and I identify more with this lady on the left, hmm, red wine, wishing that I could identify those compounds of oak, vanilla, cherry, passion fruit, or whatever it else is written on the label of your bottle. In contrast, most of us are pretty good at picking out a wine fault. So if there's some hydrogen sulphide in your wine, you might smell that rotten eggs. Or you can see the browning in wine if for some weird reason you didn't finish that whole bottle of white and let some oxygen get into it. Wine faults are an issue for both us as consumers as we don't want to spend money on something that we can't use. And also for winemakers who obviously don't want to be producing products that can't be sold or enjoyed. And therefore they're a hot topic for researchers. Friends of mine at the Australian Wine Research Institute have done some studies that have showed that metals, including copper, iron, zinc, manganese and aluminium, are somehow playing a part in the production of sulphur species like hydrogen sulphide after a wine's been bottled. Now, obviously, we're not seeing solid pieces of copper or iron in our wine. They must be there as part of soluble compounds. And one example I have here is copper tartrate. Now, this occurs when copper is bound to tartaric acid, which is the main acid found in wine. My research has involved seeing how strongly copper binds to a number of acids found in wine in the hope that we can determine how copper is likely found within a wine. I've also looked at how acids binding to this copper can affect copper's ability to play a part in other reactions within a wine. Um, and therefore stop some of these faults occurring. If we can tell how these metals are found in wine, then hopefully we can do something about stopping wine faults. Thank you, and please remember to drink responsibly. <laughs> and next up we have Samir Awad. I'll leave you to introduce your talk. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much to give me a chance to talk for my presentation. So, to interesting combine the, the project between chemistry and engineering. So, uh, my project focusing to protect the uh, temper bridges by using a smart uh, techniques to, to improve longevity and give, rest, uh, give uh, more resistance for 
temple engineering projects or uh, buildings. So in the first time, I, I selected two different uh, epoxies adhesive, which one aliphatic, another one aromatics. So I did find the epoxies, uh, industrial epoxies by uh, gas chromatogram and enamel. So I, I evaluated the epoxy adhesive uh, before and after exposure to accelerated weathering, which is uh, uh, from uh, rain, uh, rainfall and sun light, which is the UV uh, radiation equipped with the UV AA uh, 340 nanometers. So uh, the first, I found the, the aliphatic epoxy adhesive gave me with the evaluated before and after except with a good resistance to, to, to keep with the longevity. So uh, I keep this and after that, I look at to add some fillers to give more or uh, for long time for uh, uh, rest with the environmental conditions. So after that, I added some uh, natural fillers to, to, uh, to um, protect and give uh, the simple or uh, economic uh, cost uh, for the temper by epoxy. So I added uh, carbon nanotubes and uh, some organic and organic fillers and natural fillers to see and comparison what the difference between the fillers when I did the epoxy adhesive. So I, I evaluated the, the materials before and after exposure to excite with it. So I found some natural materials is good and economic cost to give and protect the, the epoxy uh, temper compasses. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Samir. I must say, communicating science clearly is difficult enough, but doing it in not your first language is very brave and very well done. Here comes another uh, international student, <laughs> Julian Klepp. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Hello. Um, most of you have probably seen or at least heard of the TV series Breaking Bad. And since its release, chemists have generally seen in a different light. Well, I'm here to tell you, most chemists do not break bad. They do break good by making remarkable contributions to society. For instance, did you know that without the help of chemists, most common prescription drugs would not be accessible? Still, as you might know, or even experienced yourselves, being sick can be quite a costly endeavor for your bank account, or at least if you played your cards right for the health, uh, bank account of a health insurance company. So why is that? Why is medicine so expensive? It's not just because all pharmaceutical companies are greedy and evil. No, it's because still medicine is quite hard to chemically synthesize. And that's why every day chemists are working hard to make the production of medicine cheaper. One idea they came up with was to use helper molecules called auxiliaries. These auxiliaries attach themselves to a chemical starting material and help to chemically transform in into the desired medicine. What is great about these auxiliaries is, once they've done their job, which was to chemically transform the starting material, they will detach themselves and release the medicine, and then can be recycled and reused in other chemical processes. Inconvenience, however, of auxiliaries is, they're still quite expensive to make, because they're made out of very costly starting material. And that's where I come in. My goal is to take a biomass-derived sugar and convert it into an auxiliary. This biomass-derived sugar is called levoglucosinone, or in short, LGO, which is made by our industrial partner, Circa, in Tasmania. And they make it out of recyclable material, such as paper, or plant material, like sawdust. So I'm going to take LGO, let chemistry play its magic, and hopefully end up with an auxiliary that can be used in the production of medicine. So to cut a long story short, I'm going to take a sugar-derived molecule. I'm going to chemically transform it into an auxiliary. And with that, we have a, what I call a double recycle cycle. Because I will take recyclable material, make a molecule that itself will be recyclable, and then hence hopefully reduce the production costs of medicine. So the golden lesson for you guys today is keep recycling and remember 
The chemistry must be respected. Thank you. Thanks, Jolene. And last, but certainly not least, my mediocre favourite student, Dean Woods. He gives me a hard time, so I've got to, got to give it back. <laughs> Uh, you may remember uh, this episode of The Simpsons where Dr Hibbard says uh, you can see the radioactive dye we've injected into Homer um, through Homer's circulatory system uh, and the nurse responds, but doctor, I haven't injected the dye yet. <laughs> we have here a basic example of radioactive elements used to image structures within the body. In this case, the circulatory system. Homer's blood has become radioactive uh, and the radioactive emissions from the elements in his blood are able to be detected uh, by a special camera and shown on the screen. Because most of us don't work in cartoon nuclear power plants, we aren't exposed to large doses of radiation that will cause our blood to become radioactive. So we actually need to introduce something into the body to show this radiation to be able to see anything on our scanner much like the dye the nurse was going to inject. And while being able to image the circulatory system is very important in medicine, I'm aiming to be a bit more specific in uh, what we're going to image. My research aims to develop metal-based uh, radioactive compounds that will be used to detect inflammation and inflammatory diseases. Inflammation can be the cause or symptom of a large variety of diseases, such as cancer and autoimmune diseases and neurological disease. Being able to spe be specifically know where in the body inflammation is would be of immense help uh, to the diagnosis of a large variety of these conditions. During inflammation, blood flow is increased in the area around it, uh, and as part of the immune response, chemicals are released, uh, to fight the foreign bodies as part of inflammation, and this changes the chemical makeup uh, of the tissue around this. Uh, I'm developing metal based sensors uh, that, when introduced to the body, will become trapped in these areas of inflammation, and we can see them on a CT scan. The way we aim to trap these is by using those chemicals produced during inflammation. Uh, they are able to steal electrons from our central metal. Um, and it'll become charged. And once it's charged, it'll sort of be trapped in the inflamed tissue. This leads to an accumulation uh, only in the areas of inflammation, we're updating failed, um, <laughs> which we'll then be able to see with a special CT scan, like I've shown. The challenge comes from making these uh, metal ions only give up their electrons in areas of inflammation and, be and not be trapped elsewhere in the body. To do this, we bind the metal ion to an organic compound called a ligand. This ligand changes the properties of the central metal, protects it, and ensures that it only gives up its electron in those areas of inflammation. Ligands with different structures will give different properties to the metal ion, and by experimenting with different ligands, we hope to one day develop a metal ligand complex that will be suitable to diagnose inflammatory disease. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Very exciting to see all the um, research that students are doing and almost makes you want to do your PhD again. Almost. <laughs> so, what we're going to do now is actually vote for our favourite rapid fire and there, there will be more rapid fires at tomorrow night's Pint of Science. And between the two nights, um, each one... Excuse me, students. Um, the winner over the two nights will win an iPad that's been donated by UNE School of Science and Technology. So on your tables is a voting slip. So Dane has requested in small groups to discuss your favourite talk, only one, and then... <laughs> A volunteer is going to come round and collect it. The winners will actually be announced tomorrow night because we'll hear more talks tomorrow night. I would like to introduce our fabulous guest speaker, Dr Liz New from the University of Sydney, to come up and give us her talk about seeing the invisible. I don't know if you need 
thank you for the invitation to come here and thank you so much for the three minute presentations. I think three minute presentations of science are the best way to hear about science. So I'm sorry that you have to hear from me for more than three minutes. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about fluorescence. In my lab, we like to work with fluorescent things, so we very regularly have to work with the lights off, or whenever we want to take pretty photos, we have to turn the lights off um, so that we can see the cool fluorescence. So hopefully you can see some fluorescence here, even though it's not dark. So if you're anything like me, your room might look something like this. So I want you to imagine for a second that you've lost your phone in your room and you can't find it. And so what will you do? You'll ring it. So you'll let your phone give out a signal in the form of sound of its location. And so it's really easy to find your phone. So this is because we need to find something in a really cluttered environment. And all around us, our environments are very chemically cluttered. They're cluttered with all sorts of chemicals. So the waterways are cluttered with a whole lot of dissolved and um, solid particles. Uh, so this graph here just shows that um, Oregon water systems contain, on average, over 30 different unique chemicals within them. And so there's a real challenge if we want to find one toxic chemical amongst all the others. We need to come up with a way, like we do when we call our mobile phone, in order to find one chemical amongst all the clutter. Another case when we need to find things in a cluttered environment is in a cell. So we often see pictures of cells that look like this. They look like empty bags just containing a few organelles here and there. But that's actually not at all what is the case. Um, here is a, a scientist's rendition of um, a small part of the cell. So here, this um, section here is the mitochondrion. And you can see that it's totally packed full of big molecules, macromolecules like DNA and proteins, and small molecules. It's a wonder that anything can happen in a cell as it does because all of these molecules need to move around each other. And so we get this real challenge that we might want to find one chemical. We might want to understand about the role of a metal in the cell. We might want to understand about a drug molecule or about a toxin. And so we've got this challenge now of looking within this complex environment and finding one chemical of interest. So if we look at this again, so one way we can do this, so when we tried to find our phone in, a, in our room, we forgot about looking and instead we listened. In finding chemicals in cluttered environments, what we can instead do is make everything black and white and then just look for one molecule over all others. And we do this by colouring the molecule with fluorescence. So we make the molecule give out light to tell us where it is. And, and so that light that it's giving out is called fluorescence. And so then it's really easy to see our one molecule over all others. So that's why fluorescence is really useful, because it's a type of light, it's an emission of light um, that we can pick out from all other types of light. So I thought I'd tell you today a bit about fluorescence. Fluorescence is all around us. We use it all the time and we talk about it a lot. Um, and there are some really simple scientific principles behind fluorescence. Then I thought I'd tell you a bit about fluorescence in biology and then how we can use fluorescent sensors and how we in our research use fluorescent sensors. So fluorescence is in everyday items around us. I don't actually have any highlighters, but uh, fluorescent highlighters do indeed fluoresce. In order to see fluorescence, we generally need to shine a light on something and then we observe light of a different colour that it gives out. So that's why I've got this uh, UV torch. Uh, it's not a proper scientific UV torch. I bought it from eBay. Um, but when we shine light on things, we see fluorescence. So we can shine light on Erica's notes and we see the fluorescence of the paper. So paper has fluorescent brighteners in it. Uh, the reason for that is because paper tends to go yellow over time. So if we can have it emit in the blue or in the ultraviolet, that will counteract the yellow and appear more white. There's a bit of an interesting story around the fluorescence in papers, um, which came uh, from this big hoax that was revealed in the 80s. Um, the magazine Stern, which is equivalent to the Life magazine in the US, so an enormous German magazine, was given some diaries um, in the 1980s that had been discovered and had been purportedly written by Hitler. They were pretty revolutionary. They said things like, Hitler never really wanted to kill anyone. He was really very gentle and kind. Um, and so the magazine decided to publish these journals. Um, but a chemist came to the rescue and was a bit suspicious and took a UV lamp and shone it on the paper of the diaries and noticed that it was fluorescent. 
And this chemist knew that fluorescent brighteners were not put into paper in the 1940s. He extracted that fluorescent molecule from the paper and found it was a fluorescent molecule that wasn't even invented until the 1960s. And so this whole thing unraveled as a hoax. A whole lot of people went to jail. The magazine lost huge amounts of money. And it all was unraveled um, because of some really simple forensic chemistry. So fluorescent brighteners are also put into clothing, uh, into laundry powder. And so white clothing will tend to fluoresce blue. We also have fluorescence in um, tonic water. So here is some tonic water from the bar here. And you can see some beautiful, hopefully you can see the nice fluorescence from it. So this is the molecule quinine that's in the tonic water that is giving out fluorescence. And also I have a solution of spinach here. So I just dissolved some spinach up in ethanol. It looks green, hopefully you can see that. But when I shine light on it, you can see it's fluorescing red. So that's the chlorophyll in the spinach. So any green plant, in fact, will fluoresce red. And if you shine this on celery, it fluoresces without even having to dissolve it. So fluorescence is all around us and um, it's used in many applications. We know the uh, banknotes of, from countries that do not have such good polymer banknotes as Australia have a lot of fluorescence in them, uh, a lot of fluorescent markers. Um, fluorescence is used very commonly to try and trace uh, where waterways go, for example. Um, and I'm sure you all can think of other examples of fluorescence like glow sticks and glow-in-the-dark paints. Um, and so we're going to talk about the fluorescent principles and how there are many similarities between them all. So, how fluorescence works. We have molecules in the ground state um, and sometimes they can absorb energy and when they absorb energy, they go to a state which is called the excited state. Molecules don't really like being in the excited state. This means they have excess energy and they like to get rid of that energy. And so they will go back to the ground state and as they do that, they will emit that excess energy in the form of light. And that is the process of fluorescence. What actually is happening is that we're getting a movement of electrons. So we have an electron in the ground state it will absorb energy and move up to an excited state. And then when it's let go, it will fall back down to the ground state and give out light. So all fluorescent processes work in exactly this way. The colour that we get from fluorescence depends on how big the energy gap was, how far the electron had to fall. So if we have a big energy gap, the electron has to fall further. That means that it gives out more energy and higher energy light tends to be more blue. If it didn't fall as far, then it will tend to give out red light. So blue light is more damaging than red light because it has more energy. So most fluorescent molecules that I've talked about until now, so the fluorescent molecules in spinach and in uh, highlighters and in tonic water are simple fluorescent molecules. So the energy that we put into these fluorescent molecules is light. We're giving them light in the form of ultraviolet light and then they're giving out light of a different colour. And so they are, there are different fluorescent molecules that are responsible for each of these processes. But there are other types of fluorescent processes which operate in exactly the same way. So a process we don't generally think of as fluorescence um, takes place in light emitting diodes. So in light emitting diodes, the energy that we put in is now electrical energy. But exactly the same thing is happening. Electrons are moving to a higher excited state and as they're being released, they're giving out light. And the color of the LED will, det um, the energy gap of, for the LED will determine the color that it gives out. Okay, another nice example of fluorescence is in glow sticks. So in glow sticks, rather than putting light energy in, we put chemical energy in. So as you break the glow stick, you cause a chemical reaction which makes molecules in their excited state and then they will naturally fall back down to the ground state and give out light in the form of chemiluminescence. And so that's why for glow sticks, we don't need to shine light on them. We can be in complete black and they will still give out light. Another thing that you may have had when you were younger are glow-in-the-dark stars. So this is a process called phosphorescence. So in this case, remember, we still need to put light in. So the energy input is still light here, but we know that we can turn the light off and for sometimes many hours afterwards, we're still seeing light coming out. And that's because in these cases, the process is very slow. 
the light, the, en- the electrons fall back down very slowly, and so that's why we can see light over many hours. And in general, phosphorescent molecules tend to be metal complexes. They're the complexes that can maintain an excited state for longer. So fluorescence is also present in biology. So some animals have fluorescent molecules, regular fluorescent molecules on them. And these are regular, they require the input of light uh, to make an excited state and then we get fluorescence. So harvestmen and fluorescent scorpions have fluorophores on their outsides. No one really understands why. It's probably something to do with their becoming more invisible during the day when ultraviolet light is shining on them and they can blend in better with flowers. But also, possibly, it might have some role at night. What's interesting is that the molecules that make scorpions fluoresce are the same molecules that are used in laundry detergents. So I don't know who first discovered that, but uh, our clothing fluoresces the same as a scorpion. But another example of fluorescence in biology is when we have glow-in-the-dark worms, glow worms or fireflies. So in this case, again, we don't need to shine light on a glow worm to make it fluoresce. It will give out light anyway. So this is a process called bioluminescence, and it's actually exactly the same as chemiluminescence. So these animals are causing chemical reactions that will make molecules in their excited state, which will then give out light. So instead of getting chemical energy by breaking a glow stick, they are performing biological reactions which make chemical energy. Uh, And the final example of uh, fluorescence in biology is probably the most famous. This was um, the uh, Nobel Prize in 2007 was for the discovery and use of fluorescent proteins. Uh, And they were first discovered in uh, these jellyfish Uh, which contain what's called the green fluorescent protein. So this is a protein that naturally fluoresces. Regular fluorescence, you have to shine ultraviolet light on it. So now you can buy these jellyfish in fish tanks and have an ultraviolet light above your fish tank so that your jellyfish will fluoresce. What was really significant, though, was the, the discovery for the gene for green fluorescent protein that could be taken and put into other animals. And so we could now make other animals that also glowed. Um, And the third discovery for which the Nobel Prize was won was discovering how to change the colour of the green fluorescent protein. So now we have yellow fluorescent protein and cyan fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein. And so we can make animals of all sorts of colours. Now, again, there is a market for this. You can buy fish of any colour which express different fluorescent proteins. Um, But there is actually a really important scientific use for green fluorescent proteins and it's really revolutionised biology. So, for example, we can make a worm where all of the cells are expressing the green fluorescent protein. That's not so useful. But what we can also do is make a worm where only the nerve cells express the green fluorescent protein. And so now we can understand which cells in our worm are the nerve cells and which cells are are other cells. And so then we can start to look at the interaction between different types of cells in a developing worm. Um, More recently has been the development of cats that express the red fluorescent protein. So on the... On the right here is a regular cat. It doesn't express green fluorescent, uh, red fluorescent protein, so it's just under green light because we need to put these cats under green light. The cat on the left does express the red fluorescent protein, so you can see it is fluorescing red. The reason this is important is because we know that gene therapy is a really promising method of correcting diseases. If we know which gene is mutated in a disease, if only we could introduce the correct version of that gene into the cells of a, of a human, we would be able to cure the disease. There are a huge number of ethical problems around it, but it's still a really important research question. How do we introduce pro, uh, genes into cells? So green fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein actually are a really useful way of seeing whether the techniques that we're coming up with are effective. So in this case, this cat was actually developed um, by taking an embryo and injecting into it a virus for the red fluorescent protein. And you can see that it's worked because every cell of this cat is expressing the red fluorescent protein. So this is a really nice demonstration that this way of introducing genetic information through a virus into the embryo is actually being successful. 
So we don't do quite such exciting stuff as making fluorescent uh, cats, but we do make fluorescent molecules that we then use to light up certain parts of the cell. So here, you can't see very well, this is a macrophage, a white blood cell under just a regular light microscope. And we have made two molecules, one of which selectively stain the mitochondria, which are the energy centers of the cell, and the other stain the lysosomes, which are kind of the garbage disposal units of the cell. And so here you can see, because one of our molecules fluoresces green and one of our molecules fluoresces red, they're lighting up different regions of the cell. And so we can use them to help us mark um, and understand how the mitochondria are acting when this macrophage is going and killing viruses and how the lysosomes are acting. So that's a bit about fluorescent stains and staining different structural parts of the cell. Um, but we're also very interested in sensing. And so this comes back to our question at the beginning. We have a really cluttered environment in the cell or a cluttered waterway, and we want to selectively understand one part of the cell over all others. So here's a simpler picture of this. We have a whole lot of different chemicals within an environment. It, this might be a cell, it might be some water. And we want to just get fluorescent information from one set of cells, we want to f uh, one set of chemicals. We want to forget about all other chemicals in the cell. Can I have a volunteer to help me with this demonstration? Oh, thanks, India. Okay. So remember we had our quinine here, our tonic water. And India is just going to shine the light on it and prove to you that it is on this. Oh yeah, on this one that it's fluorescent. Okay, can you now pour a whole lot of salt into here? Okay. So can you see now? We're just seeing the fluorescence from the glass. We're no longer seeing the fluorescence from the tonic water. Let, just to remind you, this is what fluorescent tonic water looks like. So, tonic water then is a sensor for salt. We can tell whether there is salt there based on whether the tonic water is fluorescent. So what I have here are two vials. One of the vials contains fresh water and one of the vials contains salt water. And we can't tell the difference between them, can we? And India, can you shine the light on them? Okay, we can't tell the difference between them. So what India's gonna do now is she's gonna pour a bit of tonic water into each of these. And then we will be able to discover which one is which. Thank you. Great. Okay, that's good. thanks. It's fine. It's just your mum's notes. That's okay. <laughs> it's only tonic water. Whoops. Okay, so can you hold them up now and... So, can you see now, can you turn around a bit? So one of them is fluorescing. Was that fresh or salt water? Fresh water, and the other one is not fluorescing. So the quinine or the tonic water has acted as a sensor. It has told us where there is salt and where there is not salt. Can you all give India a round of applause? So this is exactly what we do. We try to find fluorescent molecules that selectively change their fluorescence in the presence of one chemical or another. Oops. So one of the questions that we're really interested in studying is the presence of heavy metals in the environment. So heavy metals are one of the main components of the waterways or one of the main um, dissolved um, components in the waterways. And we know that heavy metals have potential toxic effects. And we have far more heavy metals in our environment now than we ever have because of the runoff from um, industry and from um, agriculture. So we uh, have developed a number of fluorescent molecules. This is one of the ones that we've made. Um, you can see the, the S and the S and the N are heteroatoms. They're atoms that like to bind to metals. And so here I've got um, some vials. The orange one is our molecule in the absence of silver and the yellow one is the molecule in the presence of silver. But it's even more exciting when I shine the fluorescent light on them, and you can see that in the presence of silver we get far more fluorescence 
and we get almost no fluorescence in the absence of silver. So what we can do now is we can take our molecule and put it into the water and identify whether there is silver present, silver that is a contaminant and that is toxic. We're also really interested in developing fluorescent sensors that tell us about biology, that tell us about the chemistry that's going on in the body. One of the big questions in the, um, understanding the chemistry of the body is about iron. We know iron is the most abundant transition metal in the body. We have about four or five grams of iron, mostly in the form um, stored in proteins. And we know it plays a really important role in taking oxygen around in our blood. But there's this age-old battle between us, our macrophages, our white blood cells, and bacteria for iron, because bacteria also need iron to survive. So bacteria have evolved ways to pull the iron away from the body, and our white blood cells have evolved ways to pull the iron back from the bacteria. And so it's thought if we can work out ways to stop bacteria from accessing iron, that's a really effective way of killing the bacteria. Something that's more recently interested medical researchers has been how we can use iron to treat cancer. So for exactly the same way, our cancer cells, which are rapidly growing, need iron to grow. So if we can stop them from accessing that iron, then maybe we can stop them from growing. So there's this idea that if we can put some iron kill later, a molecule that will take away iron into our tumours, maybe that will be an effective tumour treatment. So we have made a fluorescent molecule for iron where you can see it actually gives out two colours of fluorescence. It gives out blue and yellow fluorescence. And then when we add iron, it only gives out blue fluorescence. So now we're trying to measure how much blue light it gives out, how much yellow light it gives out, and the ratio of those two tells us how much iron there is. So here you can see, this is a bit hard to see, but we can look at cells under the microscope and we measure the blue fluorescence and the yellow fluorescence. Now, when we starve the cells of iron, you see we have more yellow fluorescence because we're going back to this stage here where the probe is turned on completely. When we feed cells with iron, we have no yellow fluorescence, we just have blue fluorescence. So now we can use this kind of output to start to answer questions about iron in cancer. So here are some... Uh, we like to grow uh, cells in spheres to mimic what a tumour looks like. So in a tumour we don't get good oxygen to the centre of the tumour. And in exactly the same way, these spheroids that we grow don't get good oxygen on the inside. Uh, and so they're a very good model for how to get drugs into the centre of a tumour. So here you can see we've taken some tumour cell uh, tumours and treated them with our probe. And we've also treated them with two iron chelators, which are currently in clinical trials as iron chelation therapy for cancer. Um, and so what you can see, we can see the blue fluorescence and the yellow fluorescence, and here is the ratio image. And on the right-hand side are some graphs which are maybe a bit more helpful because they just tell us about how the ratio changes as we go into the spheroid. What we can see here, so if we look at the ratio graphs, it's clearer, that we do get a slight decrease in the ratio at the very edge of the spheroid. But as soon as we get about two cells into the spheroid, we don't have any change. So what that's telling us is that our chelation therapy is not actually getting into the, into the tumour. It's not actually having any effect where it should be having an effect. It's just having an effect at the very, very edge of the spheroid where it's not actually going to be effective in killing the cancer. So now that we've discovered this, now that we've seen that these um, chelation therapies aren't very effective, now we can start screening new agents to see which ones actually are going to get to the centre of the tumour and be able to be effective in killing the cancer. Uh, and if another interest in our research group is about oxidation and antioxidants in the body. So we know that oxygen causes rusting. Um, and Leah already told us about how we can get rusting of wine. That is oxidation of the wine. So we can have rusting of metal, rusting of apples when we expose them to oxygen. And this is just a consequence of oxygen. Oxygen is highly reactive and it causes rusting. And it does that to us as well. Even though oxygen is essential for us, we can't survive without breathing. Every time we breathe, we're actually causing damage to ourselves because the oxygen is so reactive. So in our body, it's mainly harmful because it forms what we call a free radical. So they're molecules that have an unpaired electron. In general, electrons like to be paired. And so as soon as we have an unpaired electron, they're off trying to find something that they can react with. 
And so the first thing they bump into, they'll react with and cause damage. And that might be DNA, which can cause cancer. That might be the cell wall, which causes the cell to break. That might be proteins, which stop the proteins acting properly. So this causes cellular damage. But at the same time, we know that these free radicals are essential for our bodies. Our white blood cells, which break down bacteria, rely on free radicals. And they're also important in allowing us to just signal um, for our brains to signal for nerve activity and for all other processes. So the cell can't totally get rid of oxidants. It needs to just make sure that they're balanced. And it does this by using antioxidants. So I'm sure you all know about why we should drink wine and eat chocolate and fruits and vegetables as well. And that is because they contain high levels of antioxidants. They're a natural way for our cells to buffer against the oxidants that we have in the cell. So our cells contain this um, balance between oxidants or ROS and antioxidants. And they're pretty good at maintaining a really nice equilibrium level. There will be some points in time when we need to have more reactive oxygen species and our cells are pretty good at coming back down to baseline levels again. But there are some cases when we just have too many oxidants that the antioxidants can't counteract anymore and so now we get this elevated level, this chronically elevated level and this is called oxidative stress and there's a huge amount of interest in oxidative stress at the moment in biology and in medical research because oxidative stress is linked to almost every disease, particularly diseases that are associated with ageing. Because oxidative stress is something that just builds up over time. Uh, so it's related to obesity and cardiovascular disease and uh, neurodegenerative disease and cancer um, and diabetes. And so we're really lucky working in this area because most medical researchers are really keen to have tools to study oxidative stress. So we have approached this problem by trying to make a molecule that tells us when there is oxidative stress and when there is not. So our molecule fluoresces green when there is oxidative stress, when there are free radicals, and it is non-fluorescent when there are not free radicals. So we use this in cells to answer lots of questions. Here is one question that we were interested in. We wanted to know how much oxidative stress fat cells in our body um, experienced in cases of obesity compared to healthy cases. So here we have some healthy fat storing cells on the left and some obese fat storing cells on the right and all of the dark spots are lipid. They're just clumps of fat in the cell. Um, if you accidentally break these cells, you just get a layer of fat on top. They're really disgusting cells to work with. So on the right-hand side, you can see that our probe is much more fluorescent than on the left. That is telling us that these obese fat-storing cells are far more oxidatively stressed than the ones on the left. And this is consistent with cells in obesity just losing their function. Not only do they have more fat than they should, but they have an inability to break down that fat. And that's probably because they're experiencing oxidative stress. Um, and a final nice thing that we've done, we've made a molecule that actually changes colour. So it's green when we have oxidants and it's blue when we have antioxidants. And we've been able to put this into worms. So these are nematodes, they're microscopic worms. These nematodes grow happily at 25 degrees and at 35 degrees they're stressed. So here you can see at 25 degrees we see both blue and green fluorescence. That's telling us that there are both oxidants and antioxidants. But at 35 degrees we see no blue fluorescence, we just see green. That's telling us that these, cell, these worms are now, when they're heat stressed, they're also under oxidative stress. Um, and so now that we've discovered this, um, this is really useful because worms are actually, are actually a really nice model of ageing because you don't have to wait very long for them to <laughs> die of old age. Um, also, they've discovered a mutation that makes these, gene uh, these worms live twice as long. Um, and so we can use our probe now to see how oxidative stress is involved in ageing of these worms. Um, and I thought I'd finish just with some cool pictures that we have from our lab because that's what we do. So here's another worm and a tumor spheroid and some macrophages and some nice mitochondrial stain. Um, and I will just finish by thanking my group. This is my group on a group trip, probably in May when things are much warmer in Sydney. <laughs> um, and I'm really grateful also to the funding. And thank you so much for having me here. Okay, so now we have um, a Q&A session. 
And um, so I guess what I really want to first do is just open it to the floor to see if anybody has any questions. And I really mean any questions. Uh, any questions for our guest speaker? Any questions... Um, for me, uh, any questions about science in general that anyone else in the room might be able to answer or offer an opinion on? Uh, Sarita has a question. So Michael's going to bring you the microphone, the lovely lady here with the red scarf. Michael, Michael, this here, here, here. <laughs> yeah, bring some people up. Um, this is a question from a friend of mine. Um, you touched briefly on the brightness in paper and the fluorescence. I'm just wondering, often you'll notice in posters and things printed on paper that are old and faded, they're quite blue. I'm wondering if you have any idea why that is. <laughs> uh, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, it surprises me. I thought things that were old and faded were yellow. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting... Uh, I suspect that's actually the plastic on the poster that is being photo... Degraded. Degraded, yeah. Thank you. Who's next? Oh, we go. <laughs> Rob up the back, of course. Oh, do I need a microphone? No. <laughs> uh, good evening and uh, welcome. Uh, uh, when you look at the the fluorescence, like obviously the um, the ability for us to determine variations in light is pretty insignificant. So, you know, and there's a lot of like, my chemistry lecturer told me last year, there's a lot of like chemicals and stuff. <laughs> but, but seriously, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of structures. So how do you, you know, is it difficult to be precise to determine exactly what stuff is? Uh, yes. But, um, <laughs> so, yes. So, um, so cells autofluoresce, for example. So cells already fluoresce blue and green. So... That's why we try and make things that fluoresce red so that we know that we're only seeing our fluorescence, not natural fluorescence from the cell. We also don't just rely on our eyes, so we use spectrometers and then we look at the characteristic fluorescence spectrum of our molecule over all others. Who's next? Who's next? I'm going to hit you with another fluorescence question. <laughs> Um, you spoke briefly about using them in environmental circumstances for heavy metals and stuff like that. Um, so I guess this question has two parts. Do you have to take samples of that water to then test with fluorescence? So, yeah. Um, yeah. And then the second part, is there, are those fluorescent particles, um, is there, so say if you wanted to test them, put them in an environment and then test them with an imaging device, say that was in the air so you could get a bigger picture, is there some way to do that, or are the particles themselves too detrimental to the environment or such like? Uh, no, most of the things we make are non-toxic. The challenge is how do you... I mean, the challenge in environmental sensing is how do you make a cheap instrument to measure what's going on? And at the moment, the best is mass spectrometry because it's highly accurate but ridiculously expensive. And so we're trying to come up with cheaper ways to do that. Our... Um, we're trying to make a mobile phone detector because mobile phones can detect fluorescence. They can, you can use the camera of the phone to excite the molecule and then the camera of the phone, or the flash of the phone to excite the molecule and the camera to measure the fluorescence. And so then we wouldn't put the fluorophore into the environment. We'd take a sample and then measure it. That's our idea. We also have grand plans of putting our fluorophores into bubble wrap so that you know it's easy and portable and light, but we haven't quite worked that out yet. It's fascinating. You've got, you know, the basic chemical science. You've got all the applications, developing that, developing how to use it. it there's so many layers to, to scientific problems, and there's slots for scientists in each one of them, depending on what your interest is, is in to get involved in in research. Right, next. Kirsty, up the back there. Um, this is a fairly general question. Sorry, excuse my space ignorance. If there's only 32% of matter accounted for between dark matter and ordinary matter, what's the rest? Energy. Anyone? Is that the right answer? I don't know. I, I, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, hang on. What's the exact question again? So, That's what I, I think say to my students while I think of the answer. Or, you know, you've got one eye reading the book and one eye on the student. Yeah, I was just quite fascinated. I have no idea... 
I can do some Googling too, but I just thought someone might know. It's not a V, it's a Greek letter. I've got a Greek student, a classic student, in my third year theoretical chemistry class. And I don't know any of the letters, so I make them up. I don't know what they're called. And the students never know, but this guy knows. <laughs> and I'm like, me, nude, ski, sky, I don't know what it is. There is more dark matter in the universe than ordinary matter. Hmm. Did you say 4.9% was... Ordinary and, yeah, and 26 point something dark. was dark. That's not much. Yeah, so it must be energy. I'll, I'll look into it. Thanks, I'll get thanks, back me to too. You. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> no more hard questions. <laughs> yes, please do. Can I ask a question of Leah? <laughs> so. Where does the sulphur come from in order to be turned into hydrogen sulphide in the wine? Uh, so usually it'll come from when um, yeast is synthesising sulphur containing amino acids, so cysteine or is probably a common one or glutathione is another sulphur source. I have a few things I could ask. A few people, either our panel here or Dr. New. I might let's start with let's start with Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, what got you interested in science in the first place? I didn't. <laughs> Couldn't think of anything else to do. No, I'm only joking. Um, no, yeah, probably that actually. Yeah. You know, like you just get interested in school, and you're like, yeah, that's fun. Like, why don't I? Why don't I keep doing that? Uh, yeah. What about you two then? Let's just pass. <laughs> Um, when I started university, I wanted to be a mathematician. Uh, and after first year math, I thought that I was doing math for the sake of math and there wasn't any real point in it. Um, and I found that chemistry was more of math with an application that I could see. So that's how I got into chemistry. Well, um, I had chemistry in school and I really liked the experiments, like changing color, explo exploding things, uh, <laughs> mostly that. And then, yeah, so you see the, some TV shows out there who make chemistry seem really fun, and it actually is. So I kept going. Uh, so I do have an answer prepared. <laughs> um, can I tell two stories? One, when I was about eight, no, probably younger, um, my dad was a scientist, so <laughs> I couldn't escape it, but my mum pricked her finger and put blood on a microscope slide and I looked at blood under the microscope and I was fascinated by being able to see the cells because I guess they were still moving because it was warm, but just being able to see all the cells inside the blood and how amazing that I now get to make stuff to look under microscopes. My other story is also about my childhood. I remember vividly when I was about eight, I took a spring from one of those ring, you know, the books that have a spring in the side of them, exercise books, and I wound it up to make a really tight spring and I let it go and it went all the way across the room and I remember thinking, I have just invented a way to make energy out of nothing. <laughs> like, this is the solution to all the energy crises in the world. <laughs> and obviously I was wrong, but... That is, I think that really showed to me the power of science, that like we have a problem, we can try and come up with solutions. That's excellent. Does anyone else want to share why they are interested in science or work in science or want to work in science or just have a general interest in it? Anyone? Over no. here? No? Oh. No? No? Yeah. Uh, I like fishing when I was a kid. So. You like fishing? <laughs> okay. Uh, Imogen, Imogen up the back. <laughs> so I've just recently turned to science after 15 years working in the arts. Ooh. And so I'm saying... Congratulations. Have you made artworks with this fluorescent stuff? Because you could have a gin and tonic disco with giant jellyfish in fish tanks and people would pay for that. <laughs> so one thing I have thought about is you can't make a I mean blue flore blue highlighters are not fluorescent so despite their name blue fluorescent highlighters do not fluoresce so I think that the future 
well, the money is made in making a blue fluorescent highlighter. So the students amongst you, you can aim to do that in the future. I'm sure there will be millions in that, and then that will solve the problem of drawing artwork with highlighters. Actually, Imogen and I were having a conversation just the other day about her turning from the dark side um, to the light. But in fact, <laughs> I say that, but I'm joking because people very often say, oh, I'm a science person or I'm an arts person. And to me, they're just, they're not really separate because they're both highly creative areas. And um, well, actually earlier, Liz and my daughter were chatting about their musical um, abilities and every, every scientist I know does something creative, whether it's acting or singing or, or playing music or drawing or painting. They all have some kind of artistic outlet because they're very, very connected. And when you first start learning science, you know, and you're just learning rules and learning how to answer questions and you're not getting into that creative side, but it gets that way very quick, Imogen. What do you do, Erica? In my spare time, <laughs> I sing badly around the house. As my daughter will just, oh, mom, you're such a bad singer, stop. Uh, but I do, um, I'm, a, I'm a closet thespian. I've always wanted to be an actress. And uh, mum said, well, you'll be a waitress for the rest of your life. Um, so, but I was very good at maths. I was sucked at chemistry, in fact, which is probably why I thought hydrogen had a neutron. Um, <laughs> and I went to uni and studied I was enrolled in a science degree. Um, I didn't realise you could study dramatic arts at university. I had dreams of going to NIDA and of course they said, they won't, you can't go to NIDA straight out of school, you'll never get in. So I enrolled in a science degree because I was good at maths. Found very much what Leah said, I was just kind of doing maths for the sake of maths. Um, failed everything worse than I failed chemistry, <laughs> somehow. And then discovered theoretical chemistry, which is maths, uh, which is really mathematical physics side of chemistry. and. And that, so yeah, I've I've act, I've been on the stage. I've trod the boards in Armadale um, as a you know daily performance in the lecture theatre. And I do have to keep the students entertained. Um, but yes, and I sing as well. I sing in choirs, but I have to sing in choirs because I'm bad, so nobody can hear my voice. And I play the piano a little bit. And so yes, thank you for exposing my. <laughs> That's okay. If anyone's interested also um, in art science stuff, I'm really interested in hybrid art. Mm -hmm. So hybrid art's the idea where art and science collaborate with both with outcomes towards their own disciplines. So for art, for, on the art side, it's where you have an audience and, you know, people watch things and look at things outside of the scientific space, but for science you're also getting an outcome. And there's a really great group in Western Australia called Symbiotica. And they're definitely worth checking out. They do great projects um, with scientists. And I was down in Tassie in January and I watched a guy who created a brain cell, his own brain cell, and he was feeding it. And then that brain cell was basically reacting to sound through oh, yeah. various signal pathways. And then the guy would invite musicians in and so a trumpet player and a, like these top musicians who were at this festival in Tassie and the brain would jam with the musicians <laughs> with all the electro sounds coming out of the speakers so you would like in this space and so that kind of stuff's really cool. That's very cool. It's very Frankenstein but it's very cool. <laughs> Symbiotic, I'll check that out. But there is even now uh, there's you know researchers who look at the chemistry of art and art restoration and there's, there's a lot of crossovers. Got to be more questions. I have a few that uh, Dana suggested that I ask or we discuss. Um, well, this is an interesting one. What challenges are facing scientists in this era of fake news? Ooh. Oh, I just like making that sound. Anyone to care to comment other than the challenge of destroying Donald Trump somehow? Well, um, that's actually a good question, I think. Um, Fake news, what does it actually mean? Is mean journalists do not do the research they're supposed to do and just publishing before having solid facts. I think that's not just a scientific problem. But um, the thing is, yeah, I think you can publish uh, you can publish an article quicker about saying something rubbish about science because nobody will understand anyway, right? But I think that's not that true. I think there's much more awareness now than 
a lot of people are really interested actually in science and what's happening. So fake news, I think, are more of a political issue than in science because there are a lot of scientific people who actually read papers and then will quickly comment if there's a problem. And as she um, already explained, like with the German article there, um, you, sh you should be careful like not to, um, yeah, say something because what comes around, what goes around comes around, especially in scientific um, circles where there's a huge awareness. So no Trump in science, I'd say. But it's an interesting thing because, I mean, I think it started with general media where you've got people disengaging from the process, whether it's reading the news or listening to the news or having political discourse and so, um, and just watching reality TV and hearing things and believing them. And I think that has moved into science. You know, people say, I don't, people often say, I don't believe in science. And that in and of itself just isn't a statement that makes any sense because it's not a belief system. Um, and so then when people say there's no such thing as climate change or, and I don't know if anyone saw that funny episode of Q&A where Brian Cox had his, had his graph and he pulled it up and he was like, where's the evidence? Here it is, there's my line. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's yeah, it's an interesting question. Does anyone else have any comments or thoughts? The back here. I think it's actually an important aspect of what we're um, kind of doing tonight, in a way. I mean, I think part of the issue about that is science communication. You know, we can put out an article that will say like very technical things, and if the media gets hold of that, they don't understand what's going on. And so I think one of the most important things is to boil down our science back to the base roots of what it is and describe it so that it can be understood for everyone, especially yes. people who aren't scientifically trained. And that's kind of, you know, what one of the aims of tonight, I guess, is, and it's happening all around Australia, this event. And hopefully something like this will be able to get people talking about it in a more colloquial manner and getting more people to understand it, so. And uh, yeah, and I think, I mean, all our talks tonight, um, Dr. News talk really showed you didn't, didn't have to really understand any of the chemistry that's going on there to see how interesting and important this work is, and, and if more people could hear these things, more scientists had training and be able to, I mean, okay, some scientists, I think maybe they should just never be let out and never be allowed to talk to anyone, <laughs> but generally speaking, communication should be a big part of their training. So um, people who don't have, but even just, I find even with university students talking about the scientific method sometimes, it's just not having an understanding of what that is. Um, and they do teach it in school. I know India learned it, I think, in about second grade. Um, and that's really important that it's come all the way through. So when people are looking at data, they're, un they're understanding what it is and not saying, oh, I don't believe that or I do believe that. Yeah, so communication is, with, it, with anything, it, not just science, it, it's, it's key. Without good communication, the, the whole world falls apart. And without music. <laughs> I think music will save the world. Anyone else want to comment about fake news or science communication? Does anyone have any questions about, you know, how they might approach a career in science or, you know, they may be coming towards their end of their studies or starting studies or have a kid thinking about studying science? That want to have any questions about a career as a scientist? Best job ever. <laughs> Brayden. Uh, so this one's for Dr. New. How did you get in your, uh, into your career uh, as a scientist? How did it start? I was very fortunate. I think it is important to say that up front. Um, I studied a PhD because I was really interested in science and I wanted to learn more about it. I thought that I wanted to be a researcher, but I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, I... After my PhD, so I did my PhD in the UK, in Durham, um, which is in the north of England, very beautiful university town. Um, and then after that, I went to the US for two years to work as a researcher at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and I did not particularly enjoy my experience there. And I was ready to quit science. And then I came back to a conference here and saw and remembered that people in Australia do science because they love it, not because they want to be the best. And... So I was very fortunate that at that exact time a job came up in Australia and I could apply for it and I was fortunate to get it. Um, and so, yeah, that's how I ended up working in science. Never really understood what it meant to be a researcher. Still probably don't quite understand what it means. Um, 
but yeah, it's a great job. <clears throat> uh, why did you choose luminescence as your field of research? Is it because you like it or because you were like, you told to do it? I don't know. Uh, it just sort of happened. So my honours year, so the fourth year of my undergraduate, I was interested in studying anti-cancer drugs, platinum-based anti-cancer drugs, and my supervisor said to me, why don't you try and make it fluorescent so we can see where it goes in the cell? And I just kept going, and everything I've done ever since has been to do with fluorescence. Um, I think... The truth is that no one knows what research they want to do when they first start and it is just a matter of trying things, seeing what suits you best and then you know, going and hearing lots of talks about different areas and deciding what is most exciting. Um, so it suits me because it involves some chemistry and some biology and some photophysics um, and they're, they're things that I really enjoy but everyone's really different. Mm. And there's plenty of questions to be answered. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask this question to, I guess, any of our current researchers. Um, what are your opinions on the idea of publish or perish and how, how affected do you think you are by, by that concept? Erica and I were just talking about this. <laughs> um, we in Australia are particularly susceptible to this. I think we, we judge people on their publication records in a way that no other country, not even the US does. I don't, I don't know why we do it. I think it's because we're small enough to be competitive. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is something that we are actively working on. That it is really acknowledged that research impact is just as important as publication. Um, I think we're also lucky in Australia because it's small enough. We know that there's no number. You don't have to have 100 publications to make it. It depends on what field you're in. And we know that we will be... And I think in some ways where we in science are more fortunate than in other disciplines where they don't really bother to look into what, this, what their research is in. They just say, if you don't get a, you know, a book a year, you're not doing enough. So I think we are judged on the merit of our science. But we're also, um, but yet we're also at the mercy of this rule that says you have to have a certain number of publications to even make it. Yeah. I think also, I, I mean, I don't know if Liz agrees with this, but I think um, with you know the way people parent is changing. You know, fathers are getting more involved in parenting. Um, people are thinking about their parenting, and you know, I guess traditionally, an academic was in the lab seven days a week. Their partner raised the kids if they had kids. Many of them didn't because their life was uh, involved with their research. And I remember my I did one postdoc with CSIRO, and I had my daughter two months after I started the postdoc and my boss, who was a very successful scientist but not a Nobel Prize winning scientist, and he said, right, you've got a choice. You can win a Nobel Prize. I mean, that was a bit ridiculous, but um, be that type of scientist or you can be, and he used the word mediocre, but he didn't mean it in a negative way, and be a parent and have a life and, yeah, you'll never win a Nobel Prize, but you can contribute to science and you may not win billion dollar grants and be Brian Schmidt but you can do little bits of work you can and and that's your choice and I just thought yeah I can choose to not be the greatest scientist ever but I can still do science every day and one massive part of that that I love is the as much as I whinge about students the <laughs> the teaching of science and inspiring people to science so yeah and I think that is it's changing I think with more people saying, no, I don't have to be an ego on legs. I can, <laughs> we can be normal people and, and just enjoy our science. I'm not talking about you, Dean. <laughs> I'm an ego on legs. I just confessed to everyone I didn't know hydrogen, I had a, didn't have a neutron, so come on. <laughs> Does anyone else want to comment? Um, I, I just wanted to uh, hopefully make a contribution. There's somebody uh, from the arts side of the, the, uh, the divide and who's made some small contribution to, the, to encouraging science communications here in, in our community. Um, there are two things that I would like to challenge you with, and one's already cropped up. The use of the word belief in the current climate and the kind of discourse that we have in our societies at large, to be wary of how we use that word, um, uh, especially when we're talking about science. Um, the second one is the art-science divide, uh, to, keep, to keep following a very old and coercive discourse 
does nobody any service. Art, we can't have arts without science and we can't have science without arts. We, we as artists imagine the world that you want to fix. Uh, we can't do what we do without the work that you do. So I would from here on kind of challenge you to stop for a moment when you um, want to put shit on an artist or people who are doing arts and two, when you use the word belief because you're buying into something that's really complex, really political and uh, detrimental in the current climate to the, to the uh, practice and study of science. Cheers. Thank you very much. Much more concisely put than, <laughs> than me. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh. And, then, and then Sarah, you had your hand up? Yeah. Uh, my, my question is uh, going back to, um, uh, I guess, careers and stuff like that. We have, my wife and I, we have three daughters ranging from uh, 7 to 17. One's just about to leave um, uh, year 12 and go out uh, and start her own career. In a university town like Armidale, we get a lot, a lot of advice. And unfortunately, all of that advice um, is based on, well, don't go into that career because there's no jobs in it. Don't go into that career. But at the end of the day, we have to prepare our, our children, and in my case, three daughters, for the real world. Um, and I guess I'd ask probably some of the more experienced uh, people who work in science uh, at one level, but some of the um, yeah, PhD students at another level, w would you encourage um, your children to realistically um, chase a dream of working full-time in science? And, and are there careers for our children full-time in science? Or would they have to supplement that with something else? It's a very good question. I'll start with a couple of comments. I mean, it's very cliched, but I've, I'm a big believer in, in following your passion because I've had, I've had a lot of students I met in my life who said, well, I'm studying pharmacy or I'm studying this or I'm studying that because I'll get a job. And I say, Do you, are you interested in it? Nah, it's boring. And that will usually end up being a disaster anyway. Um, but the interesting thing about science is people think about, okay, I'll go to university, I'll study science, I'll become a scientist or a lab rat, that's what we call people who work in labs, um, and that'll be my job. But it, a science degree equips you with so many skills that can be used in a variety of different areas. For example, my area of science, which is theoretical chemistry, a lot of people who have PhDs in my field end up modelling the stock market or working in investment banks because they've, they're good with numbers and they're good at analysing things. So it's very important to understand that if you do a Bachelor of Science, it could really take you almost anywhere. And I guess the more pure it is in terms of, um, you know, I guess if you study wool science, then you, you probably pushed yourself more towards an agricultural career. And I'm, I'm not criticising that. I'm just saying you've got applied science and you've got pure science. Someone who does a degree in mathematics could... There's, limitless options. So I would say I would not discourage someone from going to science. I think like anything, it's a challenge. But if it's what you love, you, you'd, you'll find a way. I don't know if you have any... Yeah, I totally agree about, I mean, when we look at where our graduates end up, they all end up employed and they all end up in more diverse careers than they could have ever imagined. And even PhD graduates end up with such exciting and interesting careers, even if they're not in science. Um, Westpac has recently identified that they're the graduates they want are STEM graduates rather than business graduates. So that's where they're throwing all of their efforts in, in hiring. They're paying for students to do PhDs while they're employed because they, they see that a finance, financial career needs a scientifically trained person. I think we're in an interesting era now where, you know, this generation going through university, well, my generation has careers that are five years long and then they move on to the next thing. So that first degree really is only preparing them for those first five years. And so... A scientific degree is particularly useful because it can prepare students for a whole range of careers where I guess other skills are things that can be learnt on the job more. Yeah, it's, the, yeah, it's really the skill set that you're getting. Uh, Kirsty, you want to comment and then maybe hear from the actual students? <laughs> 
Sorry, I just had to say something too because I couldn't agree more. I would say I would absolutely encourage anyone to do science. It's a d completely different question. Is it encouraging somebody to be a research scientist? I think there needs to be more politicians with a scientific background. Oh. I think there needs to be more <laughs> teachers with a scientific background. The critical thinking skills, the collaboration... Um, the kind of process-driven and evidence-based understanding you get through a science degree is absolutely, across the board, one of the most sought-after graduate attributes coming out of universities today. Without a doubt, 100% encourage people to go into science in an undergraduate level. That's my two-fold <laughs> So, as current science students, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys feel about what, where you're going to go when you, when you graduate, Julian? Uh, yeah, I can actually speak a bit of Europe, especially Germany, Switzerland and odd. So if you want a career as a scientist, the unemployment rate of scientists in Europe, at least in Germany and Switzerland, is under 1%. So um, wherever they end up with, like, I mean, not only in the lab, but diplomats, patent lawyers, they actually really, people are, companies are looking for scientists who are actually not say, I want to stay in the lab, I want to do something else, because it's about this critical thinking about how do I look? Science for me was always not only about like chemistry itself, but how do I solve a problem? How do I learn to deal with a problem I don't know how the answer to? And that's what, what all the questions were about, about how f fake news and everything. It's not only about getting to know science itself better, but how can I approach a problem? And if my problem is I don't find a job, then I can get creative as well with that, right? At least. <laughs> As a, I guess, female in science, and it'd be interesting to if we talked a little bit more about females in STEM, um, but I can't imagine doing any other degree. The, growing up, science and math was, I mean, the main thing that I enjoyed um, during during school. So I think if, if it is what your daughters are passionate about, then, of course, there, there would be no hesitancy for me to encourage them to continue it. If, on the other hand, they hate it at school and don't want a bar of it, then I'm not sure that I would push them in because, as you've heard tonight, most scientists are quite passionate about what they do and, therefore, if you're not so passionate, then maybe, maybe it's not really the career that you want to follow down. Um, yeah, I'll follow from that. Um, I'm maybe not as passionate as some of the other scientists um, in the room. I sort of followed the, le the path of um, least resistance um, so far um, in that, you know, you do well at school and someone says, oh, you do science, why don't you do, why don't you do honours after you do science? You're like, yeah, okay, right. Are you a PhD after you do science? You're like, yeah, all right, why don't I? I'll do that as well. Um, and so, I don't know, I'm probably a bit more of a crossroads um, but, you know, I feel that, like, you know, science equips you with a large skill set that you can use for a variety of degrees. So, you know, while I might have just sort of dumb lucked me way here, um, <laughs> hopefully it leads to some um, exciting things in the future. Well, let me just say something in response to that. Sorry. Strangely, I know you don't suspect it, but I am a mature age student. <laughs> And uh, I am studying science, but uh, for the last 20 plus years before I came back to university, I worked in recruitment. And I worked for about uh, seven years in between London and Frankfurt and eight years in Beijing and Hong Kong. And I've also worked in Australia for several years in recruitment. And all of your answers reflect a passion for studying science. And I'm there myself, I'm doing science too. Uh, but the reality is that if you want a career in science, not a career in something else, and there, I agree with everything you've said about the, uh, the um, aptitude of taking skills learnt in a, in, through science studies, um, you know, the Westpac thing, I've heard that HSBC were doing that, you know, 10 years ago saying, bugger business, we want science for actuaries. Um, so that's a common thing because it is about evidence-based and, and critical data and all of that type of stuff. But the reality is scientists that want to be scientists are leaving Australia in droves and going overseas for work. So if you do a science degree and you're happy to work in another field, then that's great. Your chances of getting a job are actually very good in Australia. But if you do a science degree in the hope of pursuing a career in science, your options in Australia are pretty limited. 
So that's that's the recruitment reality. Um, do do people who study science get jobs? They do, and in fact, lots of employers prefer people who've done science than other degrees because it's all about facts and evidence. Yeah, and in business, that's how businesses work. But the reality of a science career is something quite different, which none of you have actually spoken about. Yeah, and I do agree with Rob. I mean, I know as someone who works in as a chemistry academic, and Liz would agree that I mean they're like hen's teeth these jobs to get. It's very, very difficult. And I mean, literally, I'll go home each night and think, oh, how did I even get this job? I paid someone. Um, no. <laughs> um, so yeah, and that is true. Um, but there's other sides of that. There's going overseas. I mean, as Liz pointed out, she lived in the UK and the US. I did my master's in the UK. I worked in the chemical industry in the UK. I did my PhD in the US. I taught in the US. So, and, and, and then there's also things that we talk a lot about in science and we talk a lot about with women in science, this idea of um, underselling yourself. So my postdoctoral work at CSIRO was in computer modelling of um, animal genetics for livestock breeding. I'm a chemist and I read this job ad. I wanted to move back to Australia and I thought, I'm screwed. I'm going to spend the rest of my life in Texas. That's where I was living, Texas people. And I <laughs> had to get out. And I thought, I'll never get a job in Australia as a scientist. Um, and I saw this position and it said, we want someone who is a physical scientist that can model stuff. And I thought, oh, I can model stuff. And so I applied for this job and I got it. And I, but I think a lot of people might have said, oh, I don't know about animal genetics. I'm not going to throw my hat in the ring. So there is, a, is an element. There, you're right. In pure research jobs, pure academic jobs, they are hard to get. But again, I wouldn't say walk away from science. But, and also, too, this is what I say to a lot of students that they start at uni. You don't have a clue what you want to do. You think you know what you want to do. I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be an Olympic sprinter. <laughs> you know, so there's also that for young people anyway. But I do agree with, with, with what Rob is saying and that is something to be considered. Sure. I think to add to that, academic jobs are hard to come by, but we don't have industry in Australia and that's our real challenge. And, you know, I mean, people... People visiting from Austra from outside say to us as academics, you know, just start companies and then your PhD students will have jobs. But it's very hard in Australia. We don't have a venture capital culture. We don't have a philanthropic culture as they do in the US. And so it's something we really need to be working on if we want to change it for the next generation. And um, the Liz and Erica show. Um, <laughs> And that is something the government, particularly um, the Office of the Chief Scientist and the Australian Council of Deans of Science have focused a lot in the last couple of years on something called work integrated learning because scientists are one of the few graduates who don't have any real um, program where they, like a doctor has to go and do their prac things and teachers have to do prac things and pharmacists do prac things and scientists don't really have any of that and we'll, they'll often come out with no entrepreneurial skills, no business skills and so that's something that is changing in science degrees so students will come out not only with those critical thinking and problem solving skills which I cannot emphasize how much problem solving skills you get from a science degree but being able to see opportunities as they arise and take risks and um, be able to communicate and all those kinds of things so the way science is being taught in Australia is changing as well and I think hopefully you know obviously we need a government that supports innovation and all that kind of thing that it, it will go that way. Does that answer your question? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, Sarah, I forgot you had a question. Uh, thanks. Uh, I just had a last, uh, two last examples, in fact, for your daughters, if you want. Uh, I come from France, and in my uh, university, when I came from uh, when I studied, uh, there was a, a guy years and years ago who studied there and he became a chemist, but uh, suddenly he didn't want it, any chemistry at all. And he just became a shepherd, a shepherd. So in fact, with uh, science, you can do almost everything, even if you're not in science after. Another example is, <clears throat> if you know uh, Big Bang Theory, the, girlf uh, the girlfriend of Sheldon Cooper is, in fact, a real uh, um, 
Sci She's a, a neuroscientist, isn't she? She, yeah. she is a, a real neuroscientist. Yeah. So in fact, and Phoebe from Friends is a biochemist. She she did um, do um, a PhD yeah. in science, yeah. and she applied for the job as a uh, actress, and she get it with surprise. But is as you can see with science, you can almost do everything, if, even if it's not in chemistry, in mathematics, or anything. It just, it, it will develop um, the way how to think and solve problems. But uh, another thing, I don't, uh, don't encourage your daughters to do automatic science because they will find a jump in anything. Uh, the thing is, be happy with what you do and like what you do. If they don't want to do science, don't force them to do science. It would be a disaster. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so my question was for the PhD students. Uh, what do you want to do after a PhD? You don't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure what I want to do, actually. Which is OK. Yeah. If you want to do I'm open a postdoc. What have you got? <laughs> Sorry? If you want to do a postdoc, go in the industry. If you want to become a teacher, an academic. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, I need, maybe I need to go to a uh, desert island for a couple of months and just sit back and, and think about it. Yeah. Last comments, and we're going to wrap it up, everyone. Sorry, dragged it on a bit. Um, I'm not 100% sure either. Um, at the moment, I've been at university a very long time and I can't even imagine not being here anymore, although it is a dream. Um, but I do... I would like to do a postdoc um, to do some more research. Um, although UNE um, is excellent, uh, we don't have a huge amount of researchers or chemists um, in our department. So I think um, I would like to go to somewhere that has a large number of researchers looking at the same sorts of topics um, to see what a bigger research group um, is like. Um, and then from there, potentially um, looking into teaching in the future. Uh, well, I don't see myself in academia because um, as already may have gone through, it's really hard to get in. You need a lot of luck as well. It's a lot of kissing the proper behinds, which I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it may, I mean, it's everywhere like that. But I think in academia, it's especially like that. Who's uh, and it's all. There's also more the tendency who's the best showman, especially in the U.S. And I think for half the trouble in Germany, I would get twice the salary working at BASF, <laughs> which is looking for scientists. So I don't. Think I, I think at the end I will end up in in the industry because just yeah I don't see myself like going from one year contract to another hoping to get another postdoc and hoping to finally have the luck to find when I know okay I can have actually a lot of research potential as well and even more money somewhere else so yeah okay I think we better stop there because Dane's having a heart attack. Um, so we do have a prize for the trivia winners, so don't run off without your prize. Um, uh, that was supplied by Unesta, Syro and Domino's. So I'm guessing it's a pizza. Um, rapid fire, guys. We've got another go tomorrow night, so we don't know who's going to win. We'll see. Um, and I just want to thank... So I've got my list of people to thank. Of course, our lovely guest speaker, Dr Elizabeth New from University of Sydney. Our... St <laughs> Our uh, student rapid fire speakers, our sponsors, CSIRO, the UNE School uh, of Science and Technology, Inspiring Australia, the New England Northwest Regional Science Hub, and Ecological, the Wicklow, uh, Ian McKay, and the AV team, Michael as well, the Unesta volunteers who have worked very tirelessly today to make this happen and also caused one of them to forget to come to my class. Um, <laughs> And thank you, everyone, for coming. Wonderful evening. It was great to see you all here.